Uh, hi. So I'm happy to see a lot of faces uh, here. So uh, before I'm starting to talk about uh, yeah, how we connect firewalls to our network, I have some questions for you. Who has heard about eVPN before the DNOC meeting? So raise up your hand. So yeah, it's, yeah, a lot of, I think more than half of people. Okay, and who has already hands-on and built an eVPN network, uh, for example, in the fabric, uh, in, in the lab, I mean, meant? So, yeah, that's just a couple. And who is running it in production? Well, it's even less. Yeah, okay. So, I, I'm not talking uh, about the basics of eVPN, but uh, are people interested in uh, having a talk about basics of eVPN. So, hands up, but I, I see a lot of uh, people waving. Yes, okay. So, I think we should uh, do a talk about the basics of eVPN because, uh, yeah, we, we, we saw in other talks, other people do eVPN too, and eVPN is coming in the uh, data center and in campus networks and on internet exchange. So, yeah, it's a technical, uh, technology for everywhere. Uh, yeah, and it's based on BGP, and yeah, I'm also a BGP lover. Um, yeah, that's yeah, that's really nice protocol. So yeah. yeah. So now about me, I'm I'm not a researcher. Uh, I'm um, I'm working at a university at the network department. That's KIT. We are university and a research center and yeah we yeah, we have to pro provide network for our students for our staff for uh, researchers with sometimes special requirements and yeah and so we have everything in our network so um, before I will go deeper and how we connect our firewalls to our network um, what are firewalls um, firewalls at KIT, when we talk about firewalls, um, yeah, they are these ugly or more or less ugly middle boxes uh, which are doing things on IP packets. Um, but for us, uh, we, we are only working on IP layer and transport layer and don't do the packet inspection or SSL inspection. Um, yeah, and firewalls. Uh, do one special thing, they do stateful filtering, so they uh, they track connections, so if the packet uh, answer is coming and there, there was an original packet scene, they uh, let through the answer, answers, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Now, uh, every time I talk to uh, people in the network community, about firewalls, the first question is, why firewalls? Firewalls are ugly, they do stuff with our packets, they uh, yeah, do bad things, but uh, most of them have background from large networks, from large data centers, and uh, not from enterprise perspective. And on enterprise or campus networks, Firewalls help to secure the network, especially with stateful firewalls. So incoming connections are blocked by default and outgoing packets are allowed. So you, you are yeah, well uh, secured from those strict kitties who are trying uh, to SSH in boxes with default credentials. Uh, and yeah, we, we, we have a security team in, at KIT which uh, scans the networks and they find everything like open memcache, like SSH uh, with guest guest, this username and passwords and uh, all those boxes are saved by just simple stateful firewalls. And other universities have this issue that if the boxes are on the internet, yeah, they get easily hacked. 
And then, yeah, in the network, uh, there are other things like uh, IoT devices, uh, which also shouldn't be directly on the internet. And yeah, at the university, we have the bring your own device policy, and we cannot enforce the people to install current patch sets. But there are data centers too. And you can find in the data center a lot of things which shouldn't be on directly connected to internet too. Yeah, from when, when you look at the data center, you have also a lot of IoT devices, which most of you won't call a IoT devices, but sensors for temperature, humidity, uh, your PDUs, your UPS, I think that's all IoT devices, which should be protected. Or the IPMI of your uh, servers should also protect it. And yeah, we have also things like uh, appliance, which also should be protected because uh, yeah, uh, some of this commercial appliance not that in that good state, bringing old kernels and so on. And then we have just the uh, users and customers um, uh, with not good knowledge of how to secure systems, or we, we have certificate requ uh, certifications or requirements which need firewalls, and yet you put it there because someone wants it, um, even if you knew, uh, open all ports at the end, but if someone requests it, you put it there. Yeah, so some eVPN basics not deep. Uh, yeah, eVPN is a standardized protocol, and we love standardized protocols at KIT. Uh, I call it a toolkit because eVPN is not one RC; it's a ton of RCs, and you can nearly do everything with it from layer two to layer three. Um, and the nicest thing is it combines, it combines layer two and layer three uh, VPNs and um, brings this Anycast gateway feature with us. And yeah, you heard it from the DKIX talk um, with this NDP proxy and R proxy um, yeah, helpers. And it helps if you have the need of layer two in your network. Um, to bring better service qualities. Yeah, and um, keep in mind, eVPN is only the, the control plane, and you always need additional protocols um, to tunnel the traffic between the PE routers. So now, the firewall thing. Um, we, we migrated from an old, yeah, not so good planned network, which was, which, which growed over the years and was a lot of layer two. Uh, and then the devices get end of uh, sale and end of support. And we need a fast way to migrate to new hardware and to get rid of layer two problems. And then we migrated to eVPN. And at the time, um, we just migrated the old firewalls to the new network and kept the classical connection. Um, so the layer two paths, you can see them here. Uh, I have to try the laser. It must be uh, somewhere here, yeah. Um, if you have clients connected to a PE, they are connected to the firewall via layer two. And the gateway sits on the firewall. And yeah, if you're planning networks, stretching layer two is always a bad idea. And uh, yeah, we, we, we are not happy with stretching layer two. Uh, but yeah, for the moment, this was the only way to keep those firewalls. Uh, yeah. Then um, the other thing is we have systems uh, on network segments connected directly to the um, eVPN fabric with the gateway sitting in the eVPN fabric. 
And then we have this firewall networks with the gateway on the firewall and the gateway behaves different. So yeah, there are standards and so on, but for example, NDP and ARP implementations are slightly different and the timers are different and we have users who are complaining about it. So yeah, on, on that network, ARP timeouts is faster than on the other or some obscure problems with uh, gracious R packets uh, are seen and yeah, that's not nice uh, or not from, from support side. It's mm, yeah, bad to have to uh, support different gateways. It's better to have the same behavior everywhere. Um, and then another thing is um, you also have different feature sets. Uh, we like to have prefix delegation uh, on all our networks, but currently on the firewalls we are using, uh, prefix delegation isn't supported. And another thing is with this classical layer two active standby uh, solution is failover, took some time and um, yeah, it, it lowers the uptime. So, yeah. We bought new firewalls. Um, we uh, started to implement them and, uh, and uh, to bring them into our network as parameter firewalls. Um, but we have different kind of firewalls. We have um, multiple layers of security. So we have a perimeter firewall, which is protecting the campus network from outside, then the internal network, which is really open. And then a second layer of networks, which is behind other firewalls. So it's additionally protected um, from our normal network so that students on Wi-Fi can uh, connect to special secured services. And the new firewalls um, should be uh, or are very good in the active active mode that they support it very well um, with the, but um, when it's when we're were, um, at the point of integration, we looked how can we um, implement the gateway uh, on the firewalls and if you do active-active uh, on the layer two network, the only solution is to something like VRP and VRP uh, sucks. Uh, there, there are a lot of issues and if someone in the network um, is flooding the packets or their loops uh, or routers think, oh, there's already in VRP speaker, I, I'm not a master, I, I'm, yeah, I'm going offline. Yeah, and the other thing is um, if you have ac multiple active routers in your network um, or multi uh, multiple active gateways uh, on IPv6, you have to think about how to handle route advertisement and the current implementation on the firewalls we are using um, sends from both active firewalls route advertisements and I've simp uh, yeah, printed here on the right side down the routing table which will be uh, on the host connected to these layer two networks and they, the hosts will um, program two default routes learned by the route advertisements. And in normal situations, everything works fine and the client or the, the host uh, will do some round drop in and send it to both gateways. But as soon as one of the firewall breaks, um, you can, uh, you have problems in your network because um, the implementation here does not switch over the link local address from one firewall to the other in failure scenarios and then the client starts to send packets to a gateway which is not available. Um, some implementations uh, detect this outage, some do not and they do uh, yeah, black route, uh, uh, yeah, route or are not able anymore to route them and drop the traffic and then you get 
yeah, strange behaviors. So um, that's not not a good solution in your network. So and still layer two stretching and the gateway behavior will sp still be uh, yeah other than on directly routed networks. And yeah, we, we were not, not so happy with the solution and we thought there must be a better way to integrate an active-active firewall solution to our eVPN fabric. And then we had the first routed only approach and the idea was, oh, let's do one VRF, one virtual routing table per security zone. And additionally, it is possible if we use one VRF per security zone to have multiple layer two network segments connected to the um, VRF. So inside of the VRF, all clients or all hosts can communica communicate with each other on line speed um, because the VRFs are implemented in the eVPN fabric and Routers are good in routing, especially if they can do it in hardware. Um, yeah, so inside uh, VRF, traffic flows really fast. And then the idea was to connect every single VRF, so every single security zone, with separate BGP sessions to the firewall. Um, it works, but it doesn't scale scale well if you have hundreds of security zones because for every security zone um, we had to connect four uh, BGP sessions with four transit networks uh, per address family and yet that's a huge amount of uh, connections and at the end you have hundreds of BGP sessions uh, which have to uh, yeah to work and to be monitored and so on. Um, and we thought, no, that's not the right way for us. We need another solution. At that point, um, we had no clue how to do it. And we thought we have to go back to the layer two stretching method and bringing all these layer two networks to the firewall. Um, yeah, and then we had Oh, next slide. Then we had a session with the uh, with the University of Dresden, and they told us, "Hey, we have a commercial implementation uh, on the network ACI, and there's possible to uh, pan the traffic to the firewall, and yeah, also." Um, I've sketched it here, so the idea is to have something, the white box in the middle, um, which is punting from the different security zones, the traffic to the firewall, and uh, between VRFs, uh, there's no um, direct connection possible, everything has to go through the firewall. Um, yeah. So, but, um, yeah, we, we, at KIT, we don't like uh, closed source things uh, or closed source standard, uh, closed standards. So we, we'd like to have open standards in our networks and to use them to understand them, so we can fix them without uh, the support of the vendor. On most times, so um, it was not uh, a right solution for us to use a proprietary solution. And um, yeah. Then the other idea was, hey, let's do policy-based routing, uh, but policy-based routing is also a thing we're trying to avoid because it's very difficult to debug. Uh, we want to use primary, uh, we want to use um, primary uh, destination-based lookup solutions or so classical routing because uh, that's easy to debug, you can do show route on your router and look, hey, where's my traffic flowing, uh, and so on, and trace out works, and that's the reason why we don't want to use policy-based routing. Um, yeah. 
So uh, from so we heard there's a property solution. So we uh, so we uh, proprietary solution. So we um, go back and did some brainstorming. How can we reach that with uh, open standards? And yeah, at the end, we found a solution to uh, use route leaking. Um, uh, we, we, we call our security zones, the VRFs for it, uh, we call it stub VRFs at KIT, and we use two additional VRFs to connect it to our firewalls. One is the VRF in and one is the VRF out. The VRF out is the one where traffic from the VRFs uh, should go to the firewall. And the VRF in is the one the firewall sends the traffic uh, to the st uh, stub VRFs and which uh, distributes the traffic. Yeah. So, and how, how can we achieve it with this additional VRFs? Um, yeah, uh, the firewall is sending a default route to VRF out. The VRF out is exporting the routes to the stub VRFs so they get the default route from the firewall and the way back is by, uh, I'm not good with this laser stuff, the stuff VRFs are sending or exporting their routes to the VRF in and the VRF in is exporting the route type 5 routes in, in eVPN to the firewall and so traffic flows the other direction like uh, than the announcements. So, more in detail, um, here you can see, um, ah, I forgot one thing. Um, now we have this WRFs, uh, we can have, uh, yeah, many of them, and uh, the WRFs together with VRF in and VRF out, we call uh, VRF complex um, in, in our terms, and we, have, we, can, we, we, we can have multiple VF complexes, uh, so we can um, have multiple active, active firewall cluster and distribute uh, the traffic among them by, um, by adding the stub VRF to a specific, specific VF complex. Yeah, so if you see the black, uh, the black lines, the black arrows, those are the traffic flows. So that's the thing I try to explain. The, the firewall sends traffic through VRF in to the stub VRFs and all the traffic leaving a stub VRF goes to the firewall. And with those solution, uh, or with this approach, we, um, we separate the traffic between the VRFs and the traffic is never flowing between those VRFs. It's always going through the firewall. And yeah, it works like a charm. It works like we expected. We tested it, yeah. And um, if we go back to the layer three tab topology of the network, uh, on the service leaves where the firewalls are connected, only the VRF in and VRF out have to be configured and these stub VRFs can be distributed uh, in the fabric where they are needed. Um, yeah. So, uh, because currently we are using Cisco, so we have a lot of experience in configured Cisco, I have added this basic example where you can see from this uh, VRF out, um, the uh, Default route ex exported with a specific route target and it's imported on the right side from the stub VRFs and the stub VRFs are exporting with a specific route targets their, their routes to the uh, VRF in and uh, at the end VRF in is announcing those routes to the firewall um, Yeah, and the, the VRF out gets the default route from the firewall and sends them to the uh, stub VRFs. Yeah. Then uh, another thing is on day-to-day -day firewall operations, um, the, 
connecting the firewall with this rotated approach changes the way how to implement the, the firewall policy rules. rules. Uh, because um, on the layer two approach, every uh, rule, rule set is connected to the interface and you can have uh, interface-based rules uh, for the specific security zones. But in this approach, the firewall behaves more like a perimeter firewall and the matching is primarily done by source and destination prefixes and um, you shouldn't use any because with any you're matching on all security zones. Um, in our network we are preventing of uh, having such a security hole by uh, good documentation and automata uh, automation. So in our automation scripts they, uh, they don't allow to use any in the rule set. Yeah, and conclusion, with uh, the solution, we are able to separate uh, the routing things, so the gateway from the firewalls, and the firewall is doing the policy uh, things, they, they are doing the firewall thing, which they are good in, and the router are doing this routing thing they are good in, and um, yeah, the firewall guys only have to do the policies on the firewall and our layer 3 staff is configuring layer 3 things on the routers. Yeah. And the gateway is behaving uh, everywhere the same because it's always an anycast gateway um, in the fabric. Yeah, and depend, uh, the scaling mostly depends on the scaling of your EVPN fabric and how many rules you can put into the firewall. And at the end, no layer two stretching is needed and that's a, yeah, a good design pattern from our side. So yeah, I've only 40 seconds left, but if someone has a question, um, which I think maybe you can do one, else write me in the mail or write me at Matrix. Thank, Thank you, you, Benedict, very much for this talk. I think, we have time for one question. So if there's one question in the audience or from the internet, we are happy to take it. Oh, yes. Over at the top right, please. Ah. Hi. Um, how do you do state synchronization between the firewalls? Uh, we are using Palo Alto and they are really good in state synchronization. So you put a layer two link between the firewalls or? Um, I don't know how they do at that point, it's a proprietary solution. Um, but uh, if you want an open source solution, look into a BSD, free BSD or open BSD, they can do it with PF sync very well. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, and a warm applause again for uh, Benedict Meutler. Wait, 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 wait. Thank you. Stop, stop. The internet has questions. Oh, the internet has a question. We have one more question. Hello, internet. How do you avoid IP spoofing? A client could evade the firewall rules unidirectionally and thus be allowed by some other firewall policies. Uh, uh, that's totally easy because we enable URPF on every client uh, side interface and spoofing is prevented with it. Okay, and there's another one, thank you. Uh, since the firewall, firewalls are notorious bad in asymmetric routing, did the asymmetric traffic flow work well with, with these firewalls? Uh, we're using Palo Alto, they can handle it, it works, works very well. Uh, I did some tests with OpenBSD and PFSync and they have a special option and then it works with, uh, with OpenBSD as well. Thank you.